I'm pleased to, to be here and be a part of you. How many parents are here in the room who have had these challenges? And professionals in the field? How many of them? So we have a mix. Uh, I am uh, very concerned, obviously, about this issue because I come at it. I'm speaking to you all. We'll talk about the way I don't have much prepared remarks here. Uh, I have uh, come at this through a lifetime of law enforcement and the law. I was a, a, a defense attorney for 10 years when I first started practicing law and graduated at UVA Law School. And I had a chance during those 10 years to spend an awful lot of time in the jails around Richmond and that community talking to people uh, who were addicted and talking to people who made people addicted. I had spent a lot of time with them. I defended people, but then I was elected to be the chief prosecutor of the Commonwealth's attorney in my home county. I spent six years there managing a large body of prosecutors and then being in the courtrooms in order to enforce the law, particularly with respect to drugs. And then became the Attorney General of the State of Virginia, and then the Governor of the State of Virginia. And I have spent quite a bit of time uh, dealing with these kinds of issues. When I came to New Hampshire to begin the process of running for President of the United States, one of the very first meetings I had was with uh, Mayor Ted Gatsis. And I sat down with Ted and I talked to him about what I, my aspirations and hopes were for the, for the United States of America based on my experience. I talked to him about my signature issue of building up the economy and about national security issues where I have an area of expertise as a veteran, as a person who was governor during the 9-11 attack, as a person who chaired the National Commission on Homeland Security for the United States. When I was done with it, I said, Ted, so tell me, what do you think is your number one problem that you're facing as mayor uh, here in this community? And he said, Carol number one issue. And I was a bit startled about it. I was just beginning to get to know New Hampshire a little bit. He talked to me with great feeling about the concerns that they were having, the pressures that it was putting on the city and on the taxpayers and on the community and on the lives of, of people and their families. So suddenly, the, one of the principal problems that we see in New Hampshire was coming home uh, to me uh, as, uh, as I was a candidate. And I reflected on it quite a bit, and I thought about it, I thought to myself, you know, what was different with respect to, to my family? I have two sons, Roxanne and I have two sons. They're both grown men now. They're uh, both working in national security in the Washington area. Both have full beards, by the way. Uh, in fact, my younger son has a beard that comes down here. He looks like Smith Brothers, who cough drops, you know, that kind of guy. We've never had a problem with either of my sons becoming involved with each of them suffered injuries, sports injuries, and things like that. I suppose they had some medication to deal with those issues, but never, as the Attorney General said, did we get into an overprescription uh, situation like that. So I'm going to start off by just saying something that, you know, that is very key. And to me, the family, it all starts with, with the family. It all starts with, uh, with getting to those kids at a very early age. I know my, my mother, when I was just a little guy now, I mean, not, not a grown man or a young teenager that suddenly becomes caught up in all of this, and then the family gets out of control, the parents feel out of control, the young person is out of control. But just as a little guy, I remember my mother always said, son, there are two things you just absolutely must never, ever do. She said, I never get a tattoo. <laughs> Because you'll be sorry when you get to be 80 that you've got that tattoo. Uh, and uh, the second thing that she said was never, ever, ever use drugs. Ever. Never give in to it. If anybody ever comes to you and suggests it, don't give in to it. You never do these things because you get out of control. And then it becomes a suffering not only for the young person as they're coming along, but for the family as well. I think that. Uh, we have tried, Roxanne and I, to impress that, to carry on that family tradition, to talk about that. And I think that, that, that that's the place where I think that, that parents who have had this, this type of tragedy and this type of human experience need to be talking to other families too, particularly when their children are, when they, their friends' children are little, and say, this has been my experience, and it's very imperative that you pass this on to the little kids uh, in your family. So I'll say two things to you, and I have a limited amount of time, and I recognize that. 
Number one, I want to talk about the people who are uh, addicts, who are addiction. And then I want to talk to you about four dealers. I want to give you my views as a candidate for president on both. Uh, I certainly believe that we have to focus our attention to law enforcement people and as public officials on the treatment of people who are who become addicts. The addiction people are out of control. They can't control it. They can't do anything about it. And they are captives. They are slaves. They are prisoners. And then, of course, they imprison their mothers and fathers as well. We do see the situation the Attorney General has talked about often in the case of veterans. And I'm emphasizing veterans' issues here in New Hampshire. I'm the only veteran in the race. I was a United States Army veteran. I was an intelligence agent assigned to Europe during the Cold War. And I have great feeling about the concerns that veterans are facing and suffering out there. And many of them have pain. Pain from their military wounds, pain from simple age, and they get prescribed the drug, the, the drugs to control the pain, and frequently it goes off into the issues then of heroin and drug addiction. I recently visited a drug treatment program in my home county, in Riker County, and I talked to two of the addicts who were there. Let's be clear, people who become addicts learn certain traits and conduct in order to kind of get over and to kind of push aside that responsibility and have a sense of what they can do to get more drugs and to come and to feed that type of habit because they're really out of control. Uh, I think that we today are not doing enough to create the opportunities in society to give people something else to focus on. Uh, we have not recovered from the Great Recession. We are not creating the opportunities for young people which will get their minds into the right places and their aspirations and career opportunities. Right now, 47% of the kids that come out of college today with a master's degree don't have job opportunities. And I know about it here in New Hampshire, where mothers and fathers tell me I want my kids to stay here and to be a part of the family and, and accept the family guidance, but they have to move to Texas or to Boston or to Virginia or someplace like that in order to have a chance to get jobs. I refuse, as a potential candidate for president, and when I become the president of the United States, I refuse to tolerate an economy that doesn't offer opportunities for young people. We will not have a lost country. So I want to speak to a great feeling of the people who are addicts, and I understand very, very well that they're captured and they're enslaved. In fact, criminal organizations will often traffic in women, as many of you all know. It's going to be hard. It's very hard to get women addicted to drugs for the purpose of them enslaving them and putting them into a position of prostitution and something that's out of their control. It's a device that is used by criminal gangs and criminal organizations. These are the tragedies of this, of this institution that is located. So, in, here in the United States. So let me speak to you about the second piece of it very quickly, and that is, and you may not want to hear this, but you know, why would I come up here and con you? This is an opportunity to really have a chance to speak to you about this. And that's to talk to you about people that sell drugs. I warn you that people who become addicts very frequently become sellers of drugs, because that's how they make the money in order to feed their own drug habit. Now, this is a very dangerous crossover when you move from being a victim, from being a person who is addicted to drugs, to a person who becomes a seller of drugs. Because I want you to know that as a former prosecutor, attorney general, and defense counsel, that I have no tolerance for people to sell drugs. None. People who sell drugs are feeding on, profiting on, the destruction of other human beings. And I, for one, am not going to tolerate it. People who sell drugs are profiting commercially, one way or the other, no matter how they intend to use the money, on the destruction of their fellow human beings. And that needs to be well understood. I remember I was asked, I was chairman of the National Commission on Homeland Security for the United States for, for five years. I actually started this commission at the request of the Congress in 1999, we issued a report in which we said that an attack on the United States was absolutely inevitable. 
and we had to begin to get prepared in 1999 for that attack. And then we issued a second report in the year 2000 that said you didn't get it the first time around. This is coming. You have to be prepared for this. This is inevitable. Of course, it was ignored. And so then, naturally, the 9-11 attack occurred. Uh, and I recognized that uh, that kind of danger happened then, this, in 9-11. I was asked to testify before the House Homeland Security Committee. And I was asked to uh, give my concerns and what I thought were the principal problems, particularly on the southern border issues. And I said, the problem that we face on the southern border is drug dealers getting drugs across the border in order to poison the youth of the United States of America. And they were surprised. They thought I would speak about you know, secret gun running and Islamic terrorists and so on like that. And I said, the problem we face on the southern border is drug dealers coming across the border. Uh, this is the challenge that we are facing. As a president of the United States, I would come to this issue with deep experience and deep concern and deep understanding of the tragedies and the destruction that this causes. And I tell you now, as President of the United States, it will be my joy to work with the governors and the Attorney General. I used to be the Attorney General of Virginia. To work with the Attorney Generals and to work with the governors in order to address these issues and begin to get a handle on this. It will not do, it will not do to emphasize what Bill Clinton said the day before yesterday when I heard his speech, and to say, well, we've got this, this wonderful drug here called Narcon. And, you know, when people have overdoses, Narcon will fix it right up. And I was thinking to myself, what a shallow, shallow view of the world. The idea that we're going to drive, drive to fix our drug problem through another drug. Yes, I don't want to see anybody overdose, and I'd love to see Narcon save another life. I'm happy with all of that. But at the end of the day, we have to go to the issues of the opportunities for young people, the family support that we give them, and the chance to really solve the underlying problems that we're facing here. Thank you very much for the chance.